Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar on SolarWords certification tips and tricks. I'm Laura Lynn McDaniel and I will be your moderator. Before I turn the program over to our speaker, I'd like to go through just a few things so you can make the most of your webinar participation. First, we are recording this webinar. So you can use the same link you used today for a year to go back and review any sections. You can also feel free to share the link with colleagues uh, to, for all the valuable information in today's webinar. Also, we will have time at the end of the presentation to answer as many questions as possible. So if you look on your screen, you should see a Q&A module. Or you can look over to the left side of your screen and see a little conversation bubble with a question mark in it. Go ahead and answer your questions there. And we will get through as many of them as we can. If we run out of time, the Dassault team may reach out to you directly to answer your question. So with that, I'd like to turn the program over to our SolidWorks expert that we have today, Ryan Culler with Dassault Systems. Ryan, program is yours. Hello and welcome to this presentation on SolidWorks certification tips and tricks. My name is Ryan Kohler and I'll be your presenter today. The topics of this presentation will be understanding the certification program, how the exam works, setting up a problem, and finally tips and tricks to design faster. To start off, we're going to focus on the certification program and how it works. Now, Many companies, when they are doing certification, it is something that is an, addi an additional purchase. It's something that is outside of the software. It's something that's different, uh, just like if you wanted support or anything else. But we're a little bit different. Uh, here at SolidWorks and with Dassault Systems, we include them with your subscription. So what that means is once you've purchased our software, you get our certifications included. No additional cost. Normally, they'd be over $100 a piece to purchase um, these industry certifications. But because you're on subscription and let's say you have uh, a variety of licenses, let's say you have up to 60 or so, you would get equal amounts of every single one of those. So our certifications to see and understand those, we have a website, solidworks.com slash certification, which outlines all of those certifications. There is an academic certification section, which is outlined specifically ones that are available for academia. And I'll go through those in a moment. Once you've seen those, understand those, and you're on subscription, you can then sign up to become a provider. And the way we do our certifications currently is that the teacher becomes a provider and you are the one that is giving the credits to the students to take the exams. So instead of it being a purchase individual for each student or going through a testing uh, center where they have to uh, be monitored, we are actually trusting you to do the monitoring and watch the students. Now, to be fair, there's no easy way to cheat on these exams. The only real way is basically to have someone else do it for you. Because the exams, uh, there are millions of variations of the same exam because of the way that we design them. It, anybody in the classroom sitting next to each other, none, they might have the same problem, but they'll, they'll have different dimensions, they'll have different things, and they will not, they'll not be complete same. We could have a thousand people in the same room and every single one would have a slightly different exam. So there's no worry about that either. As I mentioned, we do one-to-one. -one. So if the school has 60, 60 seats of SolidWorks or 3D Designer, you would get equal amount of every single one of our exams. Now, when I say every single one, what I'm talking about is that there's over 10 different industry certifications that we have access to for schools. These certifications are not designed for schools. They are 
certifications that we noticed that students were passing and we decided to basically create this program and add as many in there as we could so that you can the students can build their resume as much as possible. Now, some of these are actually required for some jobs. Um, you can actually look, and I'll show you in a moment, of different jobs where these are actually required. The Testing Center, 3D Experience at VirtualTester.com is the website. Uh, all this information would come when you sign up for to be a provider. And uh, But first, let me jump in and show you what that looks like. To start off, this is that website I first listed, solidworks.com slash certification. As you can see here, there is a ton of different certifications that we have access to. Um, they just go on and on everywhere from SOLIDWORKS to 3D experience to design to mold tools to PDM, you name it. Now at the bottom here, you'll see that there is specific ones that are designed for academia. Or, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Not designed for academia, but basically ones that we have selected for academia. Those are all listed here. Now, this first link is the one that we want to focus on. This is where you would sign up to become a provider. Many schools have access to our software, but they don't actually realize that they, are, they can sign up to be a provider. So I want to make sure everybody is aware. It's a very simple survey. All you need to do is fill out the information as a teacher and put in your information like serial number and so on, and then you'll be able to sign up. Now, as I mentioned, these can be required for jobs. So if we were to take a look at Indeed.com as an example, I just typed in SolidWorks certification just as an example, just to see what we have. We have 1,721 jobs in the U.S. that are specifically saying that you need a certification from us in order to have the job. You can see in the descriptions, two plus years experience or training on the certification. So this is saying that they're trusting that the certification qualifies you to say that you have at least two years experience. So many of these companies understand and trust that our certifications are neutral and they're very good. Now, before we jump into the actual exam, a little more details than that, let's take a look at the testing center. So if you are a teacher or you're a student and you were to get certified in any of our exams right now, you would go to this website, which is 3dexperience.virtualtester.com. Now, on this website, you'll see information on how to take the exam. You'll also see this Tester Pro client in the top right-hand corner. That's the client you need to install in order to take the exams. And if we go in further, we can go into the actual website. And there's a lot of information you have here. Once you're signed in, let's say, for example, I'm a provider, I can see that I have my exams, my credits, a lot of different information here, team info, company info, and settings. Now in the credits area, this is where you can select an exam you want to give, choose it, how many, and then you can actually give a tag on it and you can say, you know, this is class, semester one, so-and-so class. And then after that, once you've gone through that, you can then go to that tagging and you can see the exams. You can see how each student did, did they pass, did they fail. And then you can even export this into Excel and see exactly what's going on. Now, we don't give you exactly what someone did wrong. We can't tell you that, hey, they got this problem wrong and they put this answer in we can tell you is on this section, maybe it's part creation or part modification, they scored this. And that allows for teachers to scale their grades in the class. Let's say if you didn't finish working on assemblies, this will give you the chance to basically say, hey, you know, I'm going to give you the exam anyways. And if you pass your industry certification, but if you don't pass, don't worry, I'm going to scale. I'm not going to include the assembly section because, you know, we didn't have enough time to go through all that. And then after that, if you pass the exam, you get a nice little PDF QR code in the bottom left hand corner with your information of when you passed and what exam. You can also add this to your LinkedIn profile uh, and add it wherever you'd like to add it to show that you do know what you're, what you're working on. Now, 
And that's the testing environment. That's how it works. And those are different things. Now let's jump in and let's talk about how the exam works. So there, there's a variety of, as I mentioned, there's different exams that we have. But the ones we're focusing on are the ones that are designed around CAD, uh, design, around 3D design and basically competencies so that you can prove that you know how to use the CAD software. Now, the nice thing about our exams is they're extremely neutral. It is a part with dimensions and you need to create it and you need to give us some information on that. So technically speaking, you probably could use whatever software you wanted to take the exam as long as it covered the topics that we include. And to be fair, the associate level exam, almost every CAD software you can use to take it. So what that translates to for commercial is this basically says, hey, there's this exam done by this company that is proves that they at the end of the day, the student knows how to do design. And, and proves that you know how to use CAD pretty, pretty well. And they trust that. And that's why before on Indeed and other to other websites uh, for jobs, you'll see that the exam is on there because companies trust that this is a nice neutral exam that isn't saying, how do you do this in SolidWorks? How do you do this in X Design? It's just basically saying, hey, here's a part, make it. So the way the exam is set up for this one is it's going to start off with a multiple choice. We're going to have some stuff on navigating the platform, some information about collaboration, and then we're going to go a little bit deeper and we're going to go into parts and modification. Now, I can't stress this enough. If you are taking the exam and you are working on using X Design or SolidWorks, the first part, the first section of each part and modification is a multiple choice. It's going to be, hey, here's a part, here's dimensions, and you're going to do those. You're going to maybe add a material to the part, and then you're going to take a look at the multiple choice answers. If one of those is not exactly the same as what you have for either your mass or your volume, do not move on. Take the time, go through your dimensions, make sure it's fully defined. Everything they give you for information should mean that your sketch is fully defined and that nothing can move. And once you find the one 100% correct, then move on. And the reason why is if you did not get it fully 100% to one of those multiple choice, the next one is then using that as a basis. It knows how much volume has been added on the modification. And then it's basically a, a type in of what you did with regards to the volume. So if I add a volume of 100, 100 grams originally and then I modified it, and the real answer is, you know, 70 kilograms after we cut some stuff away, or 70 grams. It's going to ask us to type in that 70, and we need to be plus or minus 3% from the actual answer in order to get that right. So you do get partial credit if you got the first one wrong, as long as you made all the modifications afterwards right. But once again, it's only plus or minus 3%. Assemblies and modifications are exactly the same as above. You're going to get you're going to get parts. You're going to assemble them in the way that is specified, and then it's going to make you to it's going to ask you to change the way it's specified. Maybe change the angle, change the way a part is related, and it's going to test based on uh, the mass properties and what is the X Y Z of the center of mass. I cannot stress enough, but efficiency is key. You need to be efficient. These are not designed for someone to casually take and, you know, just pass and, and take their time and pass. Uh, many of these are three hour exams. You need 70% to pass. Now I'll show you, but we, there's a lot of different topics you need to understand to actually go through these exams. If we navigate back to the SolidWorks certification website, click on academic certification about the program. And then finally, let's just click on CSWA Mechanical Design. As you can see here, the, the page is full of information, including a sample exam, as well as the application that we talked about. And then as we go down further, you'll see the passing rate, the time it takes to take the exam, 
and then all the different sketch entities and features that you need to know in order to pass the exam. I highly suggest that you use this as a, use this as a checklist and go through each one and make sure you understand how to do each one before you even take the practice exam. Now let's focus on setting up the problem. It's very important to set up a problem correctly when it comes to certification exams. It'll make it significantly easier when it comes to answering questions and even moving through the different problems. Almost every problem, as we mentioned before, is a part that you have to create and then you have to modify afterwards. If you set it up easy in the beginning, it's gonna save you a ton of time. These are the five key steps that I suggest doing before you even start your modeling sequence. The first step, which is probably the, arguably the most important one, is identifying the unit system. As you can see on the right here, we have the practice problem from the CSWA sample exam. In here, we can see that our unit system is MMGS, millimeter gram second. We want to change that immediately inside of our SOLIDWORKS so that we can make sure we're in the right system. The second step is identifying the material. Having a proper material specified will allow us to make sure that our mass is the same when we give the, when we give the answer in the exam. You can see here we have AISI 1020 steel. The next step is to identify the origin. Now the origin, this is specific for if they ask for it, if they show it, or if you're using, if you're doing a assembly problem. Assembly problems specifically need you to give answers based on the origin. In this example, we don't need to worry about this one because it's not telling us where the origin is. The fourth one is global variables. Entering global variables, as you can see, A, B, and C, if we enter those in in the beginning and then we use those as global variables or equations for dimensions, then it's going to be significantly easier to go edit those whenever we need to do modifications to the part. And the final one, this one actually might be the most important, but save. Once you've done these steps, save your part, save it in there as whatever you want to name it, and make sure then to start the problem. Once you have saved it, you've guaranteed that you have the right unit system, the right material, the right origin, global variables, and then you're ready to go. Now let's jump into SOLIDWORKS and let's take a look at what setting up these five key steps looks like. So let's open SOLIDWORKS and let's open a new part. We're just gonna create a basic part and we're gonna follow those examples that we mentioned before. First step is units. So to do units in SOLIDWORKS, you're gonna to go to the bottom right-hand corner. And previously it said MMGS or millimeter gram second. Now we're already set to that, so we're just gonna make sure it's good. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the material. Now to do material on the feature manager on the left-hand side, you can right-click material and go to edit material. Here we're looking for AISI 1020 steel. And you'll see here we have AISI 1020, we have steel, we have a few different ones. So we wanna look for is the density. The density in this one is 0.0079 grams by millimeter squared. So if we look through these, we can see cold rolled, we have a density of 7.8, steel rolled, we have a different density, and we're looking for 7.9. So the closest one here is this one right here, mass density of 7.9 kilograms, which if you change that to grams per millimeter squared, it is 0 0.0079. So we're gonna apply this to our part, and you'll see now, once we hit close, that our materials now changed to AISI 1020. You wanna make sure the density is exactly right, otherwise the total mass of your part is gonna be off. The next step is the origin. As we mentioned, we don't have to worry about that. It's not something that uh, we have on this part. It's being specified. The final thing is the global variables uh, on this before we save. So to do global variables, we're gonna go up top to tools and we're gonna to go to equations. Now, equations, you'll see here we have global variables, feature, and equations. We're going to go in global variables and we're going to type A. We're going to put it in exactly the same as we did before. And for the value, we're going to type in 81. Now, we can do a specific unit system with this. 
Sometimes that is better. That way, if you do, if you're putting, if you forgot to put in the actual unit system of the part, this will override that and you'll see that it converts and you'll see that you put the wrong one. So in this case, we know that this is in millimeters. We're just going to leave it. We already did the first step, so we're good to go. We're going to hit tab. We're going to hit tab and keep going through. Add another global variable for B. We're going to put in 57. And then we're going to do the same for C. And we're going to put that as 43. Now, once those are done, we're going to press OK. You'll notice in the feature manager, we now have a new menu that popped up called equations. This allows us to easily access those and change those. The second part of the problem, once we, once we create the first part and we choose the, the multiple choice answer that's exactly right, we are then going to modify the part, probably do a cut, maybe a different extrude, and then we're going to change these A, B, and Cs. They put these in there for a reason. So it's going to be a lot faster if we just link those to dimensions and then we change them. And then finally, we're going to hit save. We're going to go to file save. We're going to save it to our PC and then we're ready to start building our part. Now let's go through some tips and tricks. This next section we're going to go through, as you see the list below of different tips and tricks that can be used within SOLIDWORKS, as well as I'm actually going to show you how to use some of these live while working on that sample problem. So many of them you might already know, especially with control save, control copy, and the common commands among most Windows based software. But there's a few others that are really helpful. Specifically, a spacebar, which is a view cube, allows you to choose what view you want to look at. You have the N for normal to, F zoom to fit, even some things like line command or the enter key, which brings up the previous command, arrow keys for quick rotation, and then the control arrow keys, which actually pan the model around the screen. And then some of my favorites, the S key, which is a shortcut key, and then control seven or control eight, which goes isometric or normal to. So let's hop into SOLIDWORKS. Let me show you what those look like live. All right, so let's work through this part. So we have the part set up. We've done our five steps. We've done units. We've done material. We've looked at the origin. We've added our global variables and then we saved the file. So we're ready to go. Now, taking a look at this part, you can see there's lots of dimensions. Uh, the exam is also about speed. So we want to make sure we do things in a way that we're fully divine, defining the sketch, but at the same time, we're not wasting time on things that might not be as important. So if we look at this part, you know, technically speaking, we could probably draw a big rectangle around this whole thing. And we could then use the bottom left-hand corner as our origin for us. And then we build everything into that rectangle, which gives it some nice structure. This is something that someone showed me a while ago that I've been using since. It's a great way to, to make this part a little bit simpler. So to start off, let's the, or the orientation of it pretty much looks like we're on the front plane. So we're going to click on the front plane, open a sketch, and immediately I'm going to start using some of my things called mouse gestures. Now, when it comes to speed of drawing, it definitely helps a lot to less mouse movement. The least amount of mouse movement you make usually means the faster you are at modeling. So if I use my mouse gesture, which is this right pinwheel, I hold down my right click and this pinwheel appears. Now whatever I move through turns that on. And if I move through it again, it turns it off. Just like using the escape key, it turns the function off. So I'm going to move through the bottom one and I'm going to grab a rectangle and I'm going to put this in. Now we know what A and B is already. So we know that the, this bottom one is A, which is 81. And this top, this, the height is B. So if I press escape, I'm going to press the F key to zoom to fit. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to smart dimensions and I'm going to click on this bottom line, add a dimension in, and I'm going to do what you would do inside Excel to start an equation. I'm going to press equals. Now when I press equals, you'll see I have options, global variables, functions, file properties. I'm going to go to global variables and I'm going to select A and then I'm going to click check. Now you'll notice that there's now a sigma symbol in front of that dimension. That means it's linked to our A global variable. So if we change the global variable, it'll automatically update this dimension. The same thing over here. I'm going to add a dimension. I'm going to type in equals global variables and I'm going to go over to B. 
click check, and then check again. So now those two are stuck. And the next thing I wanna do is turn off and press escape. Escape is gonna be one of your most popular keys you're gonna use. And then I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna click on each line and I'm gonna convert each one to construction geometry. Now what this does is this is still a referenceable geometry, but it's not something that we can extrude or we can use a feature with. Once I have those done, I'm then gonna start making the generic shape of what this looks like using lines and arcs and curves to kind of make it look similar to what this final product might look. So I'm gonna start off with the line function. Instead of going up top to sketches every time and clicking on line function or one of these, I can use the L key, which is a shortcut to turn on the line function, or I can press the S key, which is my favorite. The S key brings up all the commands that are built into the customized shortcut uh, command, but also if I didn't know what I wanted, I can just type in line and it'll pop up below. So I'm gonna grab line and I'm gonna start working my way around doing similar to what the actual part looks like. Now I've done this part a few times, so I kind of know where things are. I know the geometry, I know what it looks like, and I'm purposely making sure it doesn't snap to things. Now this next one, I need an arc. And I need a tangent arc. That was a cool trick in SOLIDWORKS where if you go away from the line and you go back to it, it actually turns on tangent arc. It's a sneaky way to quickly add in arcs and then it converts right back to the line function right after. So I'm making sure as I go through, I'm not snapping to any of these midpoints or any of these options that pop up. I'm purposely not doing that. And the reason why is you might have to go and delete relations afterwards if we did do that. I'm gonna grab an arc again, but that's not the type of arc I want. So I can actually go back to the corner a few times and you can swap them. Now I'm not getting the arc I want. I kind of want it in this direction. So I'm gonna press the escape key. I'm gonna click the S key and go back to shortcuts. And I'm gonna click the drop down on the arc and I'm gonna go to a three point arc. Now this arc is not tangent to the bottom, but it is tangent to another arc below. So I'm gonna do this. Once it's on, I'm gonna use the command again and I'm gonna do another arc in this direction. Now this one is tangent, but we'll add that tangency after. So I'm just gonna pop it in. And then I'm gonna go back to the line function. Now I'm just gonna move this around a tiny bit just to make it a little bit more what it might look like. It's gonna save you time later when you're actually adding dimensions and adding relations. Go back to the line function. We're gonna go straight over. And then we're gonna go back up and we're gonna completely complete the loop. Once you complete a loop in SOLIDWORKS, it automatically makes the background gray. And then from there, we can start adding what I like to do first, relations, and then add smart dimensions. So for example, we know that these two, these two right here are tangent, and then these two and these two are tangent. So if I hold down control and I click both of them and let go of control, I can then select make tangent. I can then click in the background once or press escape, I can then hold down control and click these two, let go of control, and then click make tangent again. Now immediately those, you can see the tangent relations added to those. We can move this around any way we want. It might break it a little bit, so we don't wanna move it too much. But the next thing I'm gonna do on this, on this part is we know that this arc has a dimension, but it, it also, if we look closely, and I'll bring, the, I'll bring the drawing up real quick, you can see that the center line of this arc is actually on the right edge. So if we do that, we click the center of the arc, hold down control and click this line and let go of control, we can do make midpoint or make coincident. And I'm gonna use coincident. Once, it's, once coincident's been added, you'll see it's now stuck to that line. Now it, it made a few things a little different. That's easy to do. We can start dragging things around and moving them the way similar to what they may look like and then we can add more dimensions. Now I'm gonna keep working my way through. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna speed this up real quick uh, and I'm gonna try to talk through as I go through these smart dimensions. So we're gonna add another one here for 32. We're gonna add one uh, between this and this right here for a height of seven. We're going to add an angle between these two of 45. 
we're going to add a dimension between this point and this point of 14. We know that these two, that tangency is already there. This one is a very small angle of 10 degrees. This arc is actually a one of 19. From this point to this edge is 29. The height of this line is five. The angle of this line is 45. From the top edge to this point, is 24. From this center point to the bottom edge is 19. From this point in the bottom here to this right edge is also 29. You'll see it kind of flip-flopped on it. That's not a big deal. We press escape and it's easy to drag that line back over. Turn smart dimensions back on. We're now going to give this one a radius of 29 from this from this line to the bottom edge is 19 this radius right here is 5 and then finally this bottom one is a height of 7 and the angle is 45 now you'll notice that I am now fully defined and if you're ever curious if your part's fully defined or not, if you look at the sketch, you'll see there's no minus symbol. If I delete one of these dimensions, you'll see there's now a minus symbol in front of the sketch. That's because that minus symbol means it's un underdefined. Also in the bottom right hand corner, it also says fully defined. Now there's one more step we need to do. We need to add a circle in here. So we're going to add a circle by using our mouse gesture, add the wheel in. Add a smart dimension between the, the side here and the center of 14. The center point and the bottom edge of 14 as well. And then it itself is actually 14 as well. So now we have our sketch completely done. Press escape a few times to make sure there's no function turned on. We're going to exit our sketch and we're immediately going to save it. Now I'm using control S. I'm just going to save this part. I'm going to use control S to save this part and I'm going to save it here for now. And now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to extrude it. Now, if we look, if you remember from the part, this extrusion was a width of C, which is one of our global variables. So if I click on this sketch, I then go to features and I click on extrude. It'll automatically select it. Now we don't have an origin selected, so it doesn't matter which direction we go. I'm going to type in equals again, global variables, and I'm going to go to B. Hit check. That's going to make it a, oops, sorry, wrong one. I want to make this C. Now, if you notice the global variables, it's basically just a letter in quotations. So global variable, make that C. And now our first part's done. Save it again. This is how you quickly make that. Now, if I don't have the orientation I want, let's say I want to start working on this face for the next part, I can press the space bar and click that side. I can also go up top here to my view bar and I can also choose normal to that face because I have it selected or one of the views. Or what I like to do is I like to do control eight. Control 8 goes normal to, which makes that a lot easier. If you have the material showing like mine does, you can actually turn real view graphics off and then it'll look normal. That way it's not showing the material metal. I can also rotate this. And if I go in the rotation I don't want and I want to go back to isometric, I can press Control 7. And then if you uh, ever have this happen where you uh, lost the part, it's completely off the screen. You can actually press the F key which is zoomed to fit. Now to verify we did this part right, as I mentioned the exam, you need the first multiple choice problem done right. This is the first creation of the part and then every part after every modification after that, you have to actually fill in the actual number of what the mass is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna go to evaluate and we're gonna click mass properties. Now I've done this problem many times 
so I know the actual answer. And in this case, 939.54 is the correct answer. So we did do our part correctly. But on the multiple choice, it's going to show that. It's going to show one that says 939.54. It's not, if, it, if yours says 939.75, don't select it. Go back to your part and make sure you put all the right dimensions in. Getting that first one right is essential because everyone after that, you get partial credit based on the mass you have selected in the first one. So those are some tips and tricks, some ways to design faster. So I wanted to show you those and I hope that helps out. Okay, some great tips. So I hope that information was helpful for everybody. Understanding how our exams work, how to sign up as a provider, how to take them, some tips and tricks, and even some show you some actual modeling inside SOLIDWORKS. Okay, jumped in a little early. So uh, as Ryan uh, joins us, just a reminder, we have about 25 minutes to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, as a reminder, use the Q&A module or the conversation bubble with a question mark on it. And in case we run out of time, don't be surprised if you hear from Ryan or someone else from the SolidWorks team after the webinar. So let's see. We've got... It appears that Ryan is having some technical difficulties. So let's uh, get to that. I'm looking at the questions right now to see what we have. And I think as soon as we have Ryan back up, we're going to jump into a question on students. Always an interesting situation. So we had a couple of questions on the student version. Um, so Ryan, can you tell us, can a student get certified with using the student or educational version of the software? Yeah, there's actually no difference between the commercial and education versions besides a watermark. A watermark is the only difference. So if you were to let's say uh, intern at a company for the summer and you used your education version. If you open those files in the commercial version of the company, it would say, hey, this is an education version. You shouldn't be using this here. But that's the only difference. Actually, you can use back until I believe uh, 2010 version of SOLIDWORKS to take the exams. That sounds, sounds exciting. So, in addition to having this webinar uh, to play back for a year, are there any extra re references, resources, links to recommend for an e-learner to prepare for the certification? The biggest one is the link to mysolidworks.com. There's actually an entire learning path that's specific to the different exams, the associate level, the professional level, and the expert level. Uh, that is uh, highly suggested. And then the additional one, it isn't e-learning, but it's more practice. If you just Google SOLIDWORKS practice problems, uh, you'll see a link to our website, SOLIDWORKS.com, where we have about 40 different practice problems that are designed to get you prepared for the CSWA. That's fantastic. Having studied some adult learning in my career, active practice and active learning is, is probably the best way. So let's go talk about the certification itself for a moment. Can you talk about the different levels um, of the exam? What do they indicate? How many are there? What's the process? Sure. Yeah. So for the exams, uh, if you're focusing just on, uh, well, actually, we have different categories. So there's one category that's focused on basically just CAD design or 3D design. There's also a category for simulation, and there's a bunch of other ones, flow, PDM, you name it. Uh, but the primary design is associate, professional, expert. Now, there's no prereqs. Uh, you need to finish the associate before the professional. 
And then if you were to take the expert level, there is actually um, advanced exams, professional exams you need to pass. So the expert level is the one with the most uh, requirements. It's to pass the associate and professional as well as four out of five of our advanced professional exams. And that can be mold tools, sheet metal, weld mints. Um, it could be a variety of different things. So you need to pass four to five of those, and then you can take the expert level exam. Uh, we do not include the expert level exam in the education uh, offering, uh, but we include everything before that. Though we have in many cases where a teacher has emailed us saying, students, student so-and-so has passed everything and is ready to take the expert level. Can you help us? And we have helped them out. Terrific. So speaking on that, um, is there a separate certification for SolidWorks CFD or is it included in the professional or the expert level? So it's included with the package that we offer uh, to schools. Uh, and just a reminder, if your school has SolidWorks and they're on active license, active subscription right now, you have access to every single exam I've talked about. Um, maybe your teacher might not know, maybe your IT person might not know, uh, but you do have access. Uh, the teacher can sign up with that link I mentioned before in the, if you just go to solidworks.com slash certification and you go to the student area or the academic area, there's a link to sign up as a provider. Uh, as long as the teacher signs up, you'll get all those exams and you can give them to your students. I highly suggest for those teachers that are in the room uh, that are watching right now, the biggest thing about our exams that I see for uh, schools is to build the student's resume. It's not really about what maybe it works, if it works in the classroom or not. You might have a different reason why you're teaching CAD. It might just be a tool. It might be the whole class. It doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, these certifications are very neutral. So if you take our associate level, it pretty much tells you know how to do CAD. It doesn't say, oh, I know how to use SOLIDWORKS. It just says, hey, this person.